Okay, this fellow right here is named Fat Man. Fat Man, you may recall from high school social studies class, was one of two atomic bombs that we as a country dropped on Japan at the end of World War II. One of those bombs was called Little Boy. That was the one that we dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. That was a uranium bomb. Fat Man was the bomb that we dropped on Nagasaki. Fat Man killed more than 70,000 people almost instantly, and then tens of thousands more people in the years that followed. Now, unlike Little Boy, which was a uranium bomb, uh, Fat Man was a plutonium bomb. And the plutonium that was used in Fat Man came from this place right here, uh, the Hanford Nuclear Facility in Hanford, Washington. During the 1940s and the 1950s, Hanford was essentially a factory compound designed to produce nuclear material. It had nine nuclear reactors. It employed tens of thousands of people. It created a practically endless supply of plutonium for the ginormous nuclear arsenal that we built up during World War II and throughout the Cold War. And while all of that nuclear material ultimately created the most famous nuclear weapons in human history, one of the only two nuclear weapons that everybody knows the nicknames for... All of that nuclear material being created at Hanford also created this. This is what it looks like at Hanford now. Barrels and barrels and barrels and barrels and barrels of nuclear waste that we have pretty much no idea what to do with. Nuclear waste that we have not yet figured out how to make safe, how to keep it from leaking, how to even stabilize some of it. During the latter half of the 20th century, we got really good as a country at creating radioactive material. We created it to build nuclear weapons. We created it to fuel nuclear power plants. And we did that without ever really figuring out how it was all going to end, how we were going to clean it up. The end products, right? The radioactive deadly mess produced inherently by these processes. We never figured out what we were going to do with that when we got to that point in the process. We built something that we could not ultimately handle, and now we do not know what to do with it. Well, now, in Hanford, Washington, here's what we've got. We've got six nuclear waste tanks that are leaking radioactive material into the ground. That alarming headline came out a little more than a month ago. See, the best idea we had for what to do with all of our nuclear waste was to store it in big tanks. And now those big tanks are leaking their toxic contents into the groundwater in Hanford, Washington which happens to be in very close proximity to the Columbia River, which is sort of the freshwater lifeblood of the entire Pacific Northwest. What's happening in Hanford, Washington right now is scary. But it was sort of predictable, right? This is a man-made crisis, it's a crisis of, a crisis of our own making. I mean, here's this technology that we think we need as a country. We don't really know how to handle it that well or how to clean it up if something goes wrong or even if something goes right and we just produce all the byproducts we're expecting to produce. But oh, what the heck? Full speed ahead. Sorry, Hanford. All right, um, this right here is Canadian tar sands oil. See how it kind of looks like a solid? That's part of the problem. We are currently having a big debate in this country about tar sands oil, mostly about whether or not we want to build the infrastructure in our country to facilitate the delivery of more of that chunky stuff to market. I mean, it is oil. We use a lot of oil. We need oil. We love oil. But we also happen to have no freaking clue how to handle that particular kind of oil when something goes wrong with it in transit. Tonight in Mayflower, Arkansas, here's what local officials are dealing with. That is diluted tar sands oil all over the streets, reportedly encroaching on a local lake after an ExxonMobil tar sands pipeline ruptured on Friday, dumping it all over Mayflower, Arkansas. And while it is an absolute mess for emergency response crews to try to clean it up, turns out it is a special kind of mess because it is tar sands. I mean, crude oil spills, we, we are bad at dealing with. We are bad at dealing with spills of crude. The technology has not gotten much better at dealing with spills of crude in 40 freaking years. But this isn't crude. This is tar sands. And tar sands leaks... Turns out they're way harder to clean up, and we really have no idea how to do it. We've only ever had to try it once on a big scale. There is another oil cleanup underway in this country tonight in Michigan, following a leak in a pipeline. Good evening, Brian, from the banks of the Kalamazoo River outside Battle Creek. As you can see, there is a thick coating of oil on the water here. The boom stretches right over to the other side, and you can smell it, Brian oil is in the air. This is where they're skimming. The uh, oil is coming up. It's coming into the skimmers and they're bringing it in on shore here. And what is happening now, Brian, is, is that they say that they are going to be here approximately for the next month so they can clean this up 
and get it back to the recreational use that it was before. But they say they're going to be here approximately for the next month. Hmm. They, in this case, was the Canadian oil company Enbridge. It was their tar sands pipeline that ruptured just outside Marshall, Michigan in July 2010. But cleaning up that tar sands oil spill among the Kalamazoo River did not take one month, as the company predicted. It didn't take two months or three months or four months or five months or six months or ten. It has now been 32 months since that oil spill. And there is still oil in the Kalamazoo River. And that's because tar sands oil doesn't pick up neatly with the kinds of boom and skimmers that you saw in that report. Tar sands oil doesn't just float to the top of the water where you can skim it off. It sinks where it has to be physically dredged out. When that oil spill happened, the EPA's incident commander on scene said that they were literally writing the book on how to respond to a tar sands oil spill of significant size while they were doing it. They had never done it before on that scale. The oil company Enbridge originally estimated that the cleanup process, as you heard, would take about a month. They thought it would cost somewhere north of $5 million. To date, they have spent somewhere north of $765 million, three quarters of a billion dollars to clean up that one spill in the Kalamazoo River in Michigan. This is a new technology, a new resource that that we are told we need to have immediately. Tar sands oil, build the pipeline right away. How does it affect that debate to know that we don't have any idea how to deal with this sort of thing if by some chance something ever goes wrong? Joining us tonight for the interview are two women who experienced the Kalamazoo River oil spill in their own backyards. Deb Miller's business was 20 feet from the Kalamazoo River oil spill. Suzanne Connolly's children were at a daycare center about a mile from Talmadge Creek and the Kalamazoo River at the time of the spill. Uh, Deb Miller and Susan Con- Connolly joining us tonight from Marshall, Michigan. Thank you so, mo- so, so much both for being here. It's really nice to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Susan, let, let me start with you and ask you to go back to the day of the spill. What did you and your children experience in the hours after it happened? What did it, what did it feel like and, and smell like after a tar sands oil spill like this? The smell was overwhelming. We dropped off our children at our daycare center about 7.30 in the morning. And even at that time, this, the odor was very strong. Uh, by the time we picked them up from daycare... Uh, the, the health effects were instantaneous. Um, so we knew right away that there was something wrong. We didn't realize that there was an oil spill, but we just knew something wasn't right. When you say so that the health, the health it was effects concerning. were instantaneous, what kind of health effects did you experience? Uh, there was a burning sensation in your eyes, burning in your throat. Uh, you could feel it all the way down into your lungs, headaches, migraines, nausea, upset stomach, lethargy. Within days of the spill, uh, my children and several children developed a very strange rash. So you knew right away that there was something wrong. Deb, let me ask you about um, how th- the process of the cleanup and, and what you have been told uh, by EPA or any of the other f- folks who have been involved in the cleanup about how that's going. Well, unfortunately, we've not heard anything. I am directly impacted. Um, I'm a stone's throw away from one of the three significant oil um, spots that remain. Um, The new corrective order is asking for dredging in one of those three spots. And as I said, it's a stone's throw away. I've heard nothing. I I know nothing. On my way here tonight, I see that there's a government truck um, parked in what used to be my business driveway and they're in the river putting up poles, but I have no idea what what they're doing or what it's for or anything. I found out about the corrective order because uh, it was emailed to me by uh, a media source. Wow. Um, Susan, let me actually go back to you for a second in terms of trying to understand the national significance of the Kalamazoo River spill is both that you guys are Americans, and as Americans, your problems ought to get national attention when they're big enough problems, But also, there's a big debate going on about tar sands oil versus other kinds of oil. Do you, either of you, I guess, have any sense of how it is different to deal with a tar sand spill than a regular oil spill? Well, this is the largest spill that no one knows about, which is quite concerning. Uh, As as EPA said, they're writing the book as they go along. Uh, Within days of the spill, the first thing uh, the the, uh, Unified Command did was put boom, Uh, As we're learning about tar sand, and I know I'm no expert, I'm just a mom who's been impacted, is the tar sand, it either evaporated, which we all breathed the chemicals in the air and became sick. 
The remainder of that oil, which is so heavy, it sank. It went right underneath the boom. It went underneath and continued to flow downstream. So that is a severe difference from your conventional or your mom's good old type of crude. <laughs> your mom's kind of oil spill. This is not your father's oil spill. Um, let me ask. Um, exactly. <laughs> Deb, <laughs> thinking about this and thinking about what seems evident, which is that nobody really seems to know anything about exactly how to deal with this kind of spill. Do you have any advice? Do you have anything that you've learned from this experience that you might share with the people in Arkansas who are dealing with this in their town right now? Unfortunately, we do. Um, the communication between Ambridge and the community uh, was limited at best. Um, there was the transparency was ridiculous. Um, so, as an impacted resident, for me not to know what's going on and to have to attend a public meeting, I think they've had four or five of them in the last three or four years, um, is really quite incredible. Um, and for the people in Arkansas, I can tell you, um, for th 950 days today, we have been dealing with this. I went from having to go through a police escort to get to my property for a whole summer. This year, as they start the redredging in my neighborhood or next to my house, uh, I don't know what that means. I may have to do it again. You need to document everything. Do not take anything at face value. I'm sure Exxon may be wonderful to some people. They are an oil company, and until our government realizes that this is for profit, we need to be concerned about the residents of our country and not for the profit of these big oil companies. Deb Miller and Susan Connolly from Marshall, Michigan. I know that you guys did not start off intending to be activists or even advocates on this issue, <laughs> and you got put here by dint of somebody else's uh, screw up and not your own. Um, I thank you so much for, for stepping right. up, for working on the thing that you, things that you've worked on, but also helping us understand what's going on there. Thanks to you both. Yep, thank, thank you. you. All right, thank you. All right, we've got lots still ahead tonight, including Alabama breaking new ground on civil rights in a bad way. That's still to come. Uh, but first, just one more thing about who we just had on as our guest. Susan Connolly, who was sitting on the right on the side of your screen, I feel compelled to tell you that in order to be on this show tonight, Susan Connolly had to skip out on something very important tonight. She had to skip roller derby. Susan's Marshall, Michigan roller derby team is called the South Central Michigan Renegade Roller Girls. They're gearing up for their next rock'em sock'em battle against the Lansing Mitten Mavens next Sunday. And so, yeah, Enbridge Oil Company and the Michigan state government blowing off the Kalamazoo River pipeline spill. Do you guys know what you're up against here? Are you sure? We'll be right back. <laughs> 